All right, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll get stuck in. The The Bible reading will come, don't worry. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you that uh, salvation and deliverance did come to the Jews, uh, but ultimately that it came uh, to all those who would call on your name through Jesus Christ. I uh, thank you that we can uh, finish uh, this time in Esther together, and thank you uh, for... Uh, two very big themes that come out uh, that you promise um, that deliverance will come to your people uh, and that you will give them rest. I thank you for uh, the book of Esther, even though your name is not mentioned, you are everywhere in it. Uh, we thank you for that. And we thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, well, I don't know about you, but the last few weeks... Going through the book of Esther has been a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, we've been introduced to powerful, affluent, yet debauched culture of the Persian Empire. Uh, we've had elaborate banquets that highlighted the king's perceived, possibly, absolute power and authority. A trophy wife refusing to come at the king's command, ousted and replaced by all the beautiful virgins that can be found throughout the provinces as the story unfolded, we heard historically loaded name-dropping, Mordecai, son of Kish, the Jew, and Esther, who would win the heart of the king. The second week, chapter 3 and to 5, we saw the long, dark shadows uh, creeping in. Haman the Agagite, the enemy of the Jewish people, offended by Mordecai, devising a plan to destroy, kill, and annihilate the whole Jewish people. A bit of an over-the-top reaction, some might say. But it represents a deep-seated animosity that goes back in time to King Saul and even further when the Israelites came out of Egypt and were attacked on their way to the Promised Land by the Amalekites. There is a lot of historical baggage here. Uh, but Steve helpfully highlighted for us that the enemies of God hate God's people but also that God's people have an even greater enemy in sin. As the situation and plan against God's people threatens to destroy them, there's this wonderful moment where Mordecai preaches the gospel to Esther. He shows his dependence on God and his promises, saying that salvation and deliverance or relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people. God will not let his people be destroyed. Esther willingly steps in and mediates on behalf of God's people to save them. But this just points to the mediator, Christ Jesus, the one who defeated our greatest enemy, sin. Steve spurred us on to rejoice in knowing that his attitude was not the same as Esther's. Uh, not if I perish, I perish, but when I perish, you won't. And last week we saw the great reversal starting to unfold. The plans of Haman unraveling. His wife, a pagan who had aligned herself with her husband, even she understood that because Haman, or because Mordecai was Jewish and Haman had begun to fall before him, Haman wouldn't overcome Mordecai because his downfall was certain. And wasn't it a spectacular crash? A second banquet meant to honour Haman became the very place of his destruction. Gallows erected for Mordecai becomes the place of Haman's death. Haman got so close to destroying Mordecai. Now, Phil pointed out how Satan got one step further than Haman. Jesus didn't escape death, but in fact willingly went to the gallows and to death. And yet it was in Jesus' apparent defeat that the greatest victory was won. Satan's defeat was secured. Judgment came swift for Haman. Judgment for God's enemies is also certain, and likewise, at the end, will come. Haman, the enemy of the Jews, is dead. The immediate danger is gone. There is an initial, but only partial, resolution. And so, we now pick up the story straight after these events. So Esther, chapter 8, verse 1 to 8, page 437. That same day, King Ahasuerus awarded Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, 
Mordecai entered the king's presence because Esther had revealed her relationship to Mordecai. The king removed his signet ring he had recovered from Haman and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther put him in charge of Haman's estate. Then Esther addressed the king again. She fell at his feet, wept, and begged him to revoke the evil of Haman the Agagite and his plot he had devised against the Jews. The king accepted the extended the golden scepter towards Esther. So she got up and stood before the king. She said, If it pleases the king, and I have found favor before him, if the matter seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let a royal edict be written. Let it revoke the documents the scheming Haman son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, wrote to destroy the Jews who are in the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see the disaster that would come on my people? How could I bear to see the destruction of my relatives? King Ahasuerus said to Esther, the queen, and to Mordecai, the Jew, Look, I have given Haman's estate to Esther, and he was hanged on the gallows because he attacked the Jews. Write in the king's name whatever pleases you concerning the Jews and seal it with the royal signet ring a document written in the king's name and sealed with the royal signet ring, cannot be revoked. Now this is the word of the Lord. Well, we've covered a lot over the last few weeks. And while it's tempting to see these last few chapters as just finishing off the story, there is a lot going on. As we unpack these chapters, we'll be looking at two main themes that sum up the book as a whole. Now, the theme of the threefold pattern of persecution, deliverance, and blessing, and the theme of rest. We'll also see why these themes are important for us as God's people, exiles in a foreign land, reading Esther today. Now, so you should have a outline in your bulletin, or up to point two, the great reversal. Esther is safe, Mordecai is elevated to second in command of the entire empire. Haman's estate has been given over to Esther, who in turn places Mordecai in charge. Things seem to be going well. Wrongs have been righted. And yet the fate of the Jews living in the 127 provinces is still in doubt. An edict written in the king's authority cannot be revoked. The edict of Haman calling for the death and destruction of the Jews cannot be revoked. And so Mordecai, writing under the king's authority, issues a counter-decree. Verses 11 and 12. The king's edict gave the Jews in each and every city the right to assemble and defend themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate every ethnic and provincial army hostile to them including women and children, and to take their possessions as spoils of war. In many ways, this is the same edict that went out from Haman in chapter 3. But where his edict brings death for the Jews, this edict brings life. Where Haman's was meant to punish, this one is meant to protect And while the first edict brought confusion to the city of Susa, this edict has brought rejoicing. And we catch that in verse 16, or verse 15, sorry. The city of Susa shouted and rejoiced, and the Jews celebrated with gladness, joy, and honor. This edict brings not just joy, for the Jews, but also for those in Susa. There has been a seismic shift in the response from both Jews and others within the empire. The purr is cast, the day of conflict is set. And so we pick up the story nine months later in chapter 1 of verse 9. The king's command and law went into effect on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month Adar. After such a build-up, it's a little bit anticlimactic. I don't know when you were reading through it, if you expected more, but all we get 
instead of great works of literature ebbing the flows of the day, the ebbs and flows, something akin to War and Peace or Lord of the Rings, we get one verse and just a few, a few explanatory notes. On that day, when the, Jew, Jew, the, when the Jews' enemies had hoped to overpower them, just the opposite happened. The Jews overpowered those who hated them. Just like that. It's done. Short, sweet, matter of fact. It's as though the author assumed nothing else could have happened. Of course, this is the outcome. Yes, there's been persecution, but God is faithful to his promises that his people will never be wiped out. From the capital to the far reaches of the empire, the Jews put all their enemies to the sword, killing and destroying them. Now, verse 5. And then we zoom in on the ancient rivalry between God and the enemy of God's people. The ten sons of Haman are killed, along with 500 others in the fortress of Susa. Uh, it's a nod to the failures of God's people in the past, thinking specifically about Saul and King Agag. God's people kill the line of Haman, and yet they do not seize the plunder. We're told this twice for emphasis. If that's not enough for Esther, she actually asks the king if she can have a second day to kill the enemies of the Jews in Susa. And so by the end of the second day, 75,000 people have been killed throughout the empire. Uh, verse 16, the Jews of the rest of the Jews in the royal provinces assembled, defended themselves and gained relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of those who hated them. I wonder when you read this, what were your thoughts? 75,000. That's a bit much, isn't it? Did they really need to kill that many? Before we move on to the post-conflict celebrations, I just want to highlight how gracious God is in this situation. You might ask, how on earth is God being gracious by letting 75,000 people be killed? Well, remember the time frame for what's happened. The edict to destroy, kill and annihilate the Jews went out on the first month. So we hear that in chapter 3, verse 12. The second edict went out on the third month. Now we heard that in 8, verse 9. Both came into effect on the 12th month. That's 11 months for the enemies of the Jews, the enemies of of God's people to stew and fester on the thoughts of attacking God's people. Now, this was not an irrational or spontaneous attack. No, it was planned and it was calculated. Now, those same people had nine months to change their minds when the second edict went out, allowing God's people to defend themselves. Now, throughout the text, we read that the Jews were allowed to defend themselves 8 verse 11, 9 verse 16. Uh, for the Jews, this wasn't an opportunity to expand their territory or to gain a greater position in whichever province they found themselves, but defend themselves against those who would attack them. After seeing what had happened to their father, the ten sons of Haman still attack God's people in Susa. Surely they had heard their mother's warning and still didn't heed it. And we're told that in God's grace, uh, chapter 8, verse 17, many ethnic groups of the land professed themselves to be Jews because of the fear of the Jews had overcome them. Some have seen the warning signs. They've weighed up which way history is going, and they've decided to choose God's side. There is something different and distinct about God's people that has drawn them in. In their persecution and deliverance, 
God's people have been a blessing to those around them. And so we come to the threefold pattern that we see in Esther, and that's repeated throughout Scripture. In Esther, we get this threefold pattern. God's people face persecution, God's people are rescued, and God's people are to be a blessing to the nations. God's people have been and will continue to be persecuted. The world hates God's church. It always has and always will, until the day Christ returns and ends hostility. And we heard a, a small snippet of that in the 2 Thessalonians reading. On that day, God's grace, justice, and judgment will be seen. God's desire is that as many people as possible come to him, and he's gracious in giving as many people uh, much time to know him. Nine months should have been long enough for those in the empire to change their minds regarding the edict to destroy the Jews. Are those in our communities, in our nation, those tar ethne who don't yet know the gospel, are being given time to come to know Jesus? Are we, Christ ambassadors, using that time well? Or are we not using it well? well the situation for God's people in Esther couldn't be more chalk and cheese to how things were the year before. They've ridden the roller coaster ride of persecution, they've been delivered, and are being a blessing to the nations. They are under the sent they were under the sentence of death due to the enemy of God, targeted merely for being God's people. But in the seemingly average circumstances of life, God's care and rescue for his people can be seen. He rescues them from through small royal banquets and empire-wide conflicts. He delivers them through coincidental meetings. Haman, loitering in the outer court. Non-believing servants, like the king and his sleepless nights. As a result, non-believers throughout the empire come to the faith. And Mordecai, we hear in verse, or in chapter 10, works for the welfare of his people and those he serves. Now, this pattern is seen throughout Scripture. Uh, we see it particularly in Acts and the Epistles. And ultimately, we see it in the persecution and the unjust death of Jesus on the cross. But God delivered him from death and raised him up in power. And Jesus then commissions his followers to make disciples of all nations and to bless the nations with the gospel. The early church were persecuted, scattered throughout Judea, Samaria and beyond. And as a result, more and more people came to faith. Some faced persecution to the point of death, like Stephen and James. Others were saved, like Peter and Paul. Persecution often led to the spread of the gospel and more and more people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. The spread of the good news that you can be forgiven from your rebelling against God who made you and loved you because of what Jesus did is such a blessing to those who hear it and receive it. Uh, Esther is a book for our time. God's people have always been under threat, persecuted and harassed. Now, we in the West have experienced a very strange Christianity like very few of Jesus' followers throughout history. As we see the tide of society turn against us, what should our expect expectations be? And how will we respond? Now, we've already seen some aspects start to change, haven't we? A few years ago, we saw uh, the basic meaning of marriage shift when same-sex marriage came in. It's still incredibly surprising that we have scripture in schools. That's one of, we are one of the very few state government school systems which still allow Christians to come in and teach the Bible to school kids. 
A very few places around the world have that luxury. Uh, this year and last year, I had the opportunity. I was invited to talk about Jesus at an Anzac Day service. Now, what an opportunity that is. But when these opportunities are stripped from us, and society is not just ambivalent, but antagonistic towards us, how should we respond? And we need to remember that even when God seems absent, as he does in the book of Esther, he is at work for the good of his church and for the glory of his name. The great reversal of power at the heart of the universe has already taken place. Jesus won victory over death on the cross and in his resurrection. Satan, the great enemy of God and his people, have been, has been defeated. But he is still seeking to attack and discourage us, to convince us that the rest or the way of the world is more attractive than to follow Jesus. As we seek to live out our faith under the growing clouds of persecution, it can be tiring. It can be exhausting wondering what freedom that we now enjoy will be taken away. Being overlooked for promotions on account of our faith when our secular neighbours seem to progress. Giving up sporting or musical opportunities because they clash with the gathering on Sunday. Enjoying a basic way of life when the world offers an affluent one. Being mocked and ridiculed because we believe in the risen Lord Jesus. Now we wait in the now but not yet. Christ has won the victory for us and yet we wait for his return. We wait for his return to give relief to his people to give the rest that they longed for. Now, this is what the Jews longed for and what they received. When all is said and done, the Jews received the rest and relief they sought, and rightly a time of celebration begins. First for the Jews in Susa, and then, oh sorry, first for the Jews in the country, then for those in the city. Now, verse 16 highlights this. The rest of the Jews in the royal province assembled, defended themselves and gained relief or rest from their enemies. And they fought on the 13th day of the month and rested on the 14th. Re, sorry, fought on the 13th day of the month and rested on the 14th. And it became a day of feasting and rejoicing. Uh, likewise, the Jews in Susa assembled on the 13th and 14th days of the month. And they rested on the 15th, and there was feasting and rejoicing. Well, we read how after this, Mordecai recorded these events, ordered the Jews to celebrate the 13th and 14th day of Ada each year. Because during those days, the Jews gained relief or rest from their enemies. This was the month when their sorrow was turned to rejoicing and their mourning into a holiday. After the turmoil of hearing of Haman's plan to destroy them, the Jews enjoy rest. They enjoy relief from their enemies. So much so that Mordecai and Esther send out letters with assurances of peace and security, also translated as peace and faithfulness in order to confirm the days of Purim, days of celebration and remembrance of what God has achieved for his people. God's people celebrate the peace that God had won. God's people remember the Lord's faithfulness to them. God saved his people in the time of Esther. God might rescue some of his people today, We hear of miraculous stories of people being saved. But we also hear of atrocities and where God does not save his people in this life. But he does guarantee that his people will see rest on the last day. 
that those who die in him will also rise with him. And we heard earlier how Paul praises the Thessalonians for their perseverance in the midst of persecution. Paul then promises them relief or or rest from the persecution at the return of Christ. This is our hope and longing in a world becoming more and more antagonistic towards God and his people. Esther is a unique book, uh, one where God seems absent and yet God's people are miraculously saved. The Jews were aliens and exiles in a foreign land. Believers in Christ live as aliens and exiles. And like God's people in Esther, we too may face unreasonable and erratic persecution. We live in Esther's time, when God appears hidden, but is active, unseen, but powerful, where God's people are persecuted, yet will be delivered, and in the end given rest and relief from their enemies. But as we wait, we share the good news of the gospel, call people to faith in Jesus, faithfully endure persecution knowing that our deliverance is sure. God has placed us in this world for such a time as this. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, though we may not see you, uh, that you are constantly at work in your world. Thank you that uh, while we may not understand what is going on in the world, we know that you are powerful and that you are in control. Help us to live in the light of this truth. Help us to live in light of the book of Esther, that you will bring salvation and deliverance for your people as we live under the empire. I pray that when persecution comes, uh, we will faithfully endure, knowing that when Christ comes, we will enjoy rest. Rest with you and rest with Christ. Rest with the saints who have gone before us. Uh, Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Esther and uh, for, uh, for the book of Esther for the example that it is to us, uh, that we can expect persecution, but that we can also expect deliverance. I pray that we would uh, live up to our calling to be a blessing to the nations around that, to, to around us during those times. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.